Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome David Willman. Uh, David, first of all, take us back to those days following September 11th, and, and if you could, give us a, just a brief timeline involving the, the anthrax mailings. Sure. Uh, the anthrax uh, attacks first came into public view on October 4th of 2001. That was when a photo editor at the parent offices of the National Enquirer in Lantana, Florida, was hospitalized with a life-threatening infection, which turned out to be inhalational anthrax, which mm -hmm. is uh, an extraordinary uh, event to have occurred. He died, Robert Stevens died the next day of October 5th, uh, and it took a little bit of a while, but uh, starting a week later or so, uh, there was uh, concern that maybe there was anthrax uh, coming into some media outlets in New York. There was uh, ultimately a letter recovered from NBC News that was addressed to Tom Brokaw, another to the New York Post. Uh, but the big event that put the anthrax letter attacks center stage uh, came on October 15th of uh, 2001 when a letter addressed to then Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle was opened on the fifth floor of the Senate Hart Office Building right here in Washington. And uh, the panic that ensued was, was uh, palpable mm. uh, and uh, was quite a sensation and, and immediately seen as the second wave terrorist attack on the heels of uh, September the 11th. Mm -hmm. Now tell us before we get into the investigation itself, how, how did you under, why did you undertake this project in terms of the book? Did you cover this for the, for the Times? Uh, I covered uh, <coughs> the anthrax case uh, beginning actually uh, in 2008 directly, mm. but I had written extensively uh, for the Los Angeles Times about a, a backstage battle here in Washington over uh, the anthrax vaccine. We all remember that the uh, vaccine that's been used on service members has been very controversial uh, with a lot of reported uh, adverse effects from that vaccine. There was a second vaccine, a competing vaccine, that had actually been developed at Fort Detrick, uh, that the license for which was picked up by a small little California biotech. And the promoters of that vaccine and a lot of other people in, in the, the, the U.S. Army were hopeful that it could be a, a safer and more effective vaccine. Uh, it was a genetically engineered vaccine. So in my reporting for the Los Angeles Times, I looked in depth at what really happened behind the scenes that, uh, that, uh, that did in this next generation anthrax vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, that positioned me to dive into the anthrax letter attacks right. the next year. So I was covering civil lawsuit that had been filed by a gentleman named Stephen Hatfield. Mm. And, and that, that sort of positioned me to get into this case. Right. And we'll, we'll certainly talk about Stephen uh, later, but let's talk about the central character in the book, uh, Bruce Ivins. Uh, why, do we, why do you call him the Mirage Man? Well, Bruce Ivins uh, <clears throat> was uh, a, a fellow who led a uh, double secretive life. Mm -hmm. And those who thought they knew him well or even knew him best uh, didn't know anything about this second alternative life that he was mm -hmm. leading, right. uh, a life in which he pursued secretive vendettas against individuals and institutions. Uh, so that, that's the, the title, The Mirage Man. Right. And um, now let's just cut right to the chase. Do you think Bruce Ivins did it? Do you think he sent out these anthrax? Well, in my, re in my research for the book, <coughs> uh, I backgrounded uh, Bruce Ivins' life from actually his prenatal care all the way mm. through to uh, the day of his death on July 29th of 2008, and uh, in looking at the totality of the evidence that is out there, uh, I think that it uh, points persuasively toward his guilt. Right. Of course, we'll uh, we'll never. Do you think we'll ever completely know the truth? Obviously, he committed suicide three years ago. Do you think the truth will ever come out definitively about about Bruce Ivins? Well, complete truth is a is a very difficult yeah. uh, concept, isn't yeah. it? Uh, there's a lot of evidence out there about this case and and about Bruce Ivins. Uh, that I think, when looked at in the calm light of day, is persuasive. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that there are, are facts that we don't know about? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a complete version of truth is, is pretty elusive. Right. What was um, his ultimate motivation uh, you know, to commit this murderous act? Right. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, his suicide in July of, of 2008, uh, he took with him uh, a lot of secrets, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what we do know about, about Bruce Ivins is that uh, he was a guy who was, uh, had a very difficult time adjusting socially from uh, grade school early on in, in, uh, rec when I rec reconstructed his life going out to southwest Ohio. And then on the way through, he had, uh, er he had deep need, uh, and, and it took uh, bizarre forms for uh, attention and approval. Mm -hmm. 
And when he didn't get those things, uh, particularly from certain individuals uh, and institutions, he became deeply vengeful. And he pursued those vendettas in a very secretive way that persisted for decades. So as an adult, um, he craved the attention and the, the approval. Uh, I, what I found in the research for my book is that he was uh, extreme, he grew increasingly angry over the threatened status of his baby, as one of his colleagues described it to me, Bruce's baby, his pet project, which was, it turns out, the next generation anthrax vaccine, the genetically engineered vaccine, uh, which he had co-invented. And uh, he knew from meetings he was attending in person at the Pentagon, uh, 2001 to 2000 into 2001, that that project was really moribund. It was, it was, uh, it was stifled, it was dead in the mm -hmm. water. In the words of the supervising major general, who I quote in The Mirage Man, uh, this project was beyond the back burner. Um, Bruce Ivins was a, a student of what it took to get things going, and um, ultimately, uh, crisis is what gets policy moving in this country. Uh, he knew that. So what's the ultimate motivation? I mean, we know that what happened as a direct result of the anthrax letter attacks, to get ahead a little bit into policy, mm -hmm. is that something called Project Bioshield was passed. And uh, the first contract awarded under Project Bioshield, a multi-billion dollar effort, was for $877.5 million to develop the long more of a next generation anthrax vaccine. Mm -hmm. Bruce's baby, the right. product upon which he held two patents. Right. You sort of referred to some of his uh, personal demons and quirks. Uh, can you tell us about some of them, uh, including his obsession with the Kappa Kappa Gamma sorority? Uh, tell us about that. And, and there was a sort of a role that the Kappa Kappa Gamma played in terms of the mailings themselves. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Bruce Ivins uh, was an undergraduate at the University of Cincinnati and actually then obtained two graduate degrees, our master's and, and a PhD. Uh, as an undergrad, he asked a young woman out for a date and she turned him down. Uh, she moved on and actually quickly forgot about most of it, but he never did. Mm -hmm. And uh, he became obsessed with Kappa Kappa Gamma and targeted uh, individual members of the sorority and the institution itself. He committed uh, two burglaries that we know of uh, at Kappa uh, houses, uh, both in Cincinnati and in Morgantown, West Virginia, where he stole uh, artifacts having to do with the sorority and uh, the cipher and book of ritual, which to him was the Holy Grail, which, which spelled out all of Kappa's secrets. He mm. placed classified ads in Mother Jones Magazine and Rolling Stones Magazine offering to send the Book of Ritual and all these secrets to anyone who wrote in, uh, which he did. And he rented that post office box uh, per his custom in uh, a pseudonym, a, a woman's name. Uh, so that's uh, some of the example of, of, uh, of his obsession with this, with this sorority and with certain individuals with it, one of whom was a woman he met uh, while he was a postdoc at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. The woman's name is Nancy Haywood. Some of you may have heard of her. She was then a doctorate, uh, doctoral student and a former Kappa, a mentor to Kappas on campus. He became utterly obsessed with her and was for the balance of his life. And uh, he confided, in fact, to a psychiatrist who I cite in my book, Dr. Naomi Heller, that uh, he had uh, had a plot, a specific plot to poison and kill her mm. as of 1979. Mm. Uh, let's, uh, let's move to more of the government uh, reaction to, to the anthrax mailings. Uh, certainly, the government was going into uncharted territory uh, with these attacks, I mean, this being the first anthrax attack on America. How would you sort of grade the, the government response uh, looking, you know, 10 years later mm -hmm. at this point? Uh, well, well, this is obviously an incredibly tough case for the FBI. Mm -hmm. sure. And though there had been an, uh, scores, maybe hundreds of hoax letters in the <coughs> previous years, this was their first real deal. And at the time of the anthrax letter attacks, I believe the FBI employed a grand total of two microbiologists. Mm -hmm. So really uh, a tough case, and they were already completely extended in investigating the September 11th attacks. Right. Then here we have a letter opened up in Senator Daschle's office. And uh, for those of us who were in Washington at that time, uh, I mean, I'm not ashamed to say a number of us were just scared to death. I had colleagues sure. who had to go on CIPRO because they were working in the Hart Building. But a very tough case for the FBI. I think they were slow off the blocks. Uh, but they did gather themselves and with the help, as I point out in the book, of a woman named Rita Colwell, who was then the director of the National Science Foundation. They cobbled together a stable of elite, really world-class uh, scientists to help assist the investigation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think eventually got on a more solid footing, at least on the scientific aspect. Right. Let's talk more about the political implications. Uh, I mean, you argue, certainly, that the uh, Bush administration used the anthrax scare uh, to, to gain support 
for invading Iraq. Tell us, tell us why, you, why you believe that. Hmm. Well, I think, uh, first of all, you have to appreciate the context. Sure. Uh, there are prominent members of the Bush administration uh, who had written to then President Clinton in 1998, uh, and let's just name two of them, that would be Paul Wolfowitz and uh, Donald Rumsfeld, mm -hmm. saying that the only acceptable policy uh, for the United States was to topple Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. uh, these are people who were deeply dissatisfied with uh, uh, President Bush's father's decision to pull back and stop short of Baghdad. So the anthrax letter attacks, <coughs> excuse me, were a gift in the lap of those within the administration and w without the administration, mm -hmm. people in Congress, people at think tanks, people in the media, who were gunning for Saddam. Uh, there were a lot of, con lot of conjecture about Saddam's possessing weapons of mass destruction. The anthrax letter attacks were real. That was a, quote, yeah. WMD. It was the wolf's fangs right. in, our in, our, in our face. Mm -hmm. um, so it was utilized. Uh, Tom Ridge, former Secretary of Homeland Security, told me in interviews for this book, that there were uh, people in the White House who believed absolutely, in the words of Secretary Ridge, that Saddam Hussein was behind the attacks. Paul Wolfowitz told me in an interview for this book that he was persuaded that Saddam Hussein and or Al-Qaeda uh, were behind the anthrax letter attacks. When Don Rumsfeld went to Capitol Hill seeking uh, support for the, to give the president authorization to take action against Saddam, he, he very closely juxtaposed the anthrax letter attacks with all of Saddam's other sins. When Colin Powell went to the United Nations on February 5th, 2003 to make the case uh, to the world community for taking out Saddam, he held in his finger a, a very small little vial of white powder, mm -hmm. said that less than two, two teaspoons full of this powder had killed two postal workers in the anthrax letter attacks. That's not accounted for. None of the stocks that, were, that uh, the administration suspected Saddam of possessing had been accounted for. Let's, let's go get Saddam. Uh, finally, President Bush himself in his memoir, Decision Points, um, spoke very sparingly uh, about the anthrax letter attacks. Uh, he did, however, say that the big question about the anthrax letter attacks in his mind, or in the mind of those around him at the time, was who, uh, who was behind it. And the next sentence was, a highly respected European intelligence service told us that Saddam was behind the anthrax letter attacks. So there was this inevitable juxtaposition, and it was, it was, it was without question a part of the buildup toward war. Right. Is it, conceivable, is it conceivable that we might not have gone into Iraq if the uh, anthrax attacks never happened, or is that? I, that, I guess that's like complete truth. I mean, we'll never, yeah. we'll, <laughs> right. we'll, we'll never know that. Right, um, right. And you, but you point out that the media was somewhat complicit in linking the attacks uh, to Iraq. You, you note uh, uh, ABC in particular. Can you tell us a little bit about Brian Ross's reporting? Sure. Uh, Brian Ross uh, led World News Tonight on October 26, 2001 with a shocking uh, expose. That, uh, that analysis of the attack material that had been sent to Senator Daschle, that analysis of that material uh, by Army scientists had found that uh, it contained an additive called bentonite, uh, which in context was already known to be a, uh, a, a, a suspected signature of Saddam's uh, formerly nascent biological weapons program. So if this attack material, this anthrax that was mailed to Senator Daschle and others here in the United States, contained bentonite, that was a red flag that pointed mm -hmm. right at, uh, uh, at uh, Saddam Hussein. Um, in the words of uh, uh, a high-ranking biodefense uh, uh, advisor to the Bush uh, administration at that time, uh, Bob Cadlick, uh, who was involved in the meeting, uh, one of the meetings in which this was discussed, I mean, uh, this appeared to be Cassus Belli. So ABC mm -hmm. News reported on October 26, 2001, they had several reports in the following days in which uh, Brian Ross and ABC said they had two sources, three sources, four sources that proved that it had bentonite. Turns out to be uh, completely false. Uh, but that story has never been walked back. Uh, obviously, it's never been retracted. Brian Ross did tell me uh, in my reporting for this book uh, that his sources were, in his words, completely wrong. Hmm. Well, um, I'm going to get to Stephen Hatfield now. Uh, you know, the FBI thought earlier that it was Hatfield, it was an open and shut case uh, against, against Apple. First of all, tell us just a brief bio of, of Hatfield and, and what evidence did they have against him for these, for these mailings? All right. Well, Stephen Hatfield is a vi virologist, virologist. Uh, who from uh, 1997 to roughly September of 1999 worked at Fort Detrick and more particularly uh, in the United States Army Medical Research Institute uh, of Infectious Diseases there within Fort Detrick uh, studying viruses. Um, uh, so. The anthrax letter attacks hit. Uh, Hatfield was a was sort of a swashbuckling guy mm -hmm. who was always talking about uh, his 
exploits uh, when he was working in other places around the world. And uh, several people, uh, former colleagues of his, uh, called the authorities and said, you know, you ought to look at this guy. Uh, as I report in this book for the first time, a polygrapher with uh, uh, a certain uh, federal agency called the FBI and said, you know, you ought to look at this guy. Um, so he was, uh, he was investigated very vigorously, and I try to, I think my uh, extensive reporting of this uh, uh, in the book makes clear that uh, you can't fault the FBI for doing that. However, at a certain point, uh, the evidence stopped. Uh, he was a virologist. He had no experience in handling anthrax. Uh, he did not have access, uh, it turns out, ultimately to, well, either the AIM strain or this at attack material. Um, but uh, they stayed on Hatfield. We can get into uh, some of the other reasons why they did that, which I think are fascinating. Yeah, well, and also, this being the museum, I, I want to bring up the media angle on this, because I think it's safe to say they, they fanned the flames against, against Hatfield, and in particularly a, a certain New York Times columnist. Can you tell us about that? Well, it's true. Uh, a prominent columnist for the New York Times, um, uh, Nick Kristof, wrote uh, a, a number of columns in 2002 that uh, fingered Stephen Hatfield as a likely perpetrator of the attacks. Uh, along the way, uh, Christoph uh, said in his columns, uh, without attribution, that uh, Hatfield's anthrax uh, vaccine uh, inoculations, his, his uh, shots were up to date, which, by the way, turns out uh, not to be supported by the evidence. Um, he said that Hatfield uh, may well have been handing out Cipro to people at a secret safe house that may have had some shadowy tie to the intelligence world. Those things just aren't supported by the evidence. Now, uh, Christoph and others also, by the way, credulously um, swallowed uh, this information about these bloodhounds, which many of you may recall, these magical, supposedly omniscient bloodhounds that were brought in from Southern California that uh, uh, traced uh, the attack material and the scent of Stephen Hatfield supposedly to a number of these ponds in the Frederick Municipal Forest up above Frederick. Mm -hmm. And uh, the leader of the FBI investigation was very persuaded by that evidence. Wow. And in fact, he and the FBI director, Bob Mueller, briefed that evidence uh, with total seriousness uh, to Senators Daschle and Leahy on the night of uh, January 29th, 2003. That's a long time after they started uh, investigating Stephen Hatfield. And uh, they were trying to, to get the case against Hatfield buttoned up and uh, in, indicted. And there was a certain prosecutor who stood in the way of that. Mm -hmm. what, uh, tell us what Stephen, what ha eventually happened to Hatfield? What is he doing now? Right. Well, Hatfield uh, uh, quickly lost his job in the private sector with a military uh, defense contractor. Uh, he sued uh, a number of media organizations and he sued the United States government, more particularly the FBI and the Justice Department. And in June of 2008, uh, won a settlement uh, worth $5.82 million. Mm. Uh, so two months later, in late August of 2008, uh, the United States attorney here in Washington sent an explicit letter of exoneration to Hatfield's lawyer, so he was completely cleared. What's he doing now? He lives at least part-time uh, in Northwest Washington mm. and uh, wants to go into the Amazon and try and discover drugs maybe that could provide cures. Uh, we do want to hear from our audience, so if you do have a question, please raise your hand. And it looks like we have our first question. We'll, we'll go over there to the blue shirt, and then we'll get to uh, over here. That'd be great. We have one, yeah, one mic there. Perfect. Richard Lambert. I've read your book, and it's very good. Richard Lambert, the lead uh, for the FBI uh, that steer, seemed to steer the investigation to uh, Hatfield. Whatever happened to him? I know he was replaced by Montooth. What happened to Lambert? Was he ever... Discipline for his no. Uh, Richard Lambert, uh, as of September of 2006, was uh, uh, elevated or transferred, however you want to look at it, uh, to be the special agent in charge for the FBI uh, at their office in Knoxville, Tennessee, where he uh, remains. Um, frankly, a lot of the scenario of this reminds me of the Batman animated series characters. You know, Enigma comes up and got all this bad stuff in his industry. But the question that comes to me is, do you have any guess as to why the targets were picked that he picked? I think that the objective of the anthrax attacks was to create maximum fear and attention for our vulnerability to an anthrax attack. Because if we're vulnerable to anthrax, what do we need? We need a, a vaccine, a vaccine we can trust. And we've got one that's now been taken out of action Crisis, fear is the one thing that can rescue it. So how do you generate the crisis? 
Well, sending it to the, to the most notorious tabloid uh, in the United States, if not the world, is probably not a bad first start. Sending it to a, a national uh, network anchor is another step. Sending it to the biggest circulation mainstream tabloid in this country, the New York Post, another good step. And then for good measure, sending this weapon of mass destruction into the heart of the national government, the Senate Majority Leader, and a second letter, by the way, was addressed, as we know, to then Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Pat Leahy. But due to a snafu with the mail the postal system coding, uh, fortunately for, for people on Capitol Hill, that letter never reached Senator Leahy's office. But the net effect of those targets was to create, and I think did create, maximum shock and awe. Uh, you need shock and awe. You need fear to create crisis. That's what drives policy. It's a marketing campaign. Good point. The uh, return address on two of the letters, is that correct, said uh, Greendale Elementary School? Tell us about the, uh, how, I guess, the agents, FBI agents made the connection between that and, and Ivan's. Fourth, yeah, the, the return address on the, the, uh, w the second batch of letters, including the one that went to uh, Senator Daschle's office, was fourth grade Greendale School. Greendale School, yeah. Right. And uh, so as people who read the book, you'll notice that there's uh, one agent among all of others who uh, challenged the orthodoxy within the FBI investigation and I think with tremendous courage helped steer this case away from Stephen Hatfield to Bruce Ivins. And so uh, Lawrence Alexander, uh, with the help of, of others he worked with, uh, drilled down, drilled down and find, found out that Bruce Ivins and his wife were subscribing to uh, a publication called American Family Journal, which was mm -hmm. connected with a, uh, with a Christian group. Um, and it turned out that um, that, in, that organization had been uh, very excited and publicized in the same journal uh, a lawsuit that had been filed uh, out in Wisconsin uh, in which this or same organization, AFA, had filed a friend of the court brief uh, at the Greendale School. It's a private school. State authorities had come in to investigate uh, something to do with corporal punishment involving a fourth grade student. So that's quite a coincidence to have not only mm -hmm. Greendale School but fourth grade student mm -hmm. um, in a publication that Bruce Ivins was subscribing to. We've just got a few more minutes. If we have any more questions, please just, just raise your hand. I do want to, oh, we have a question right there. Perfect, yep. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I guess my question, and I had this feeling at the time, was that uh, the, the mailings occurred so soon after the September 11th attack that it, it would seem that somebody was ready to do this and almost, uh, you know, was, so do you think that that uh, that Ivans was 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 waiting for some kind of triggering event, or would he have gone ahead with it anyway? Do you have any insight into that? Could, that seems to make this make the terror, uh, you know, the fear and so forth uh, impact much greater because it was so close in time. Right, uh, great question, um, and it also points out uh, one of the uh, most, I think, powerful pieces of evidence against Bruce Ivans, which is that Bruce Ivans. Uh, alone among any scientist who had potential access to this rare batch of anthrax, uh, began working uh, extraordinary late night hours in a biocontainment hot suite where you have to go in, you have to uh, put special gown uh, gear on, take your clothes off, you're in that environment and, and as you're getting out you have to shower out. So it's not like just hanging out in, in a lab with a few rabbits or in, your, in, in another non-containment suite. He started that in late August. Now, bear in mind, he was furious uh, even before then about uh, the moribund status of his baby, the next generation anthrax vaccine. Um, he had all sorts of anthrax uh, in his possession that was labeled in ways that only he would know. So he, uh, he had plenty of access to the material. So the September 11th attacks happened. And uh, I think what the evidence suggests is that uh, the first batch of anthrax, and the first batch, by the way, of letters uh, were, were, were postmarked on September 18th. Uh, it's very fast after the letter attacks. Uh, and that first batch that went to Tom Brokaw, that went to the New York Post, uh, was really crude material. I mean, it looked like uh, pepper you would shake out of a, out of a shaker at Denny's. Um, it wasn't the really fine uh, white powder that was sent to Senator Daschle later. So it suggested a rush job. Uh, unfortunately for Bob Stevens, the photo editor down in Florida, it was good enough to kill him. Uh, up in New York, all we had were uh, cutaneous anthrax cases. Um, so that's, I, I think that the, the uh, September 11th tax 
uh, provided an opportunity uh, uh, and an imperative for uh, the perpetrator to accelerate. Oh, we have a question in the third row there. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned oh. Ivan's wife. Has she been uh, helpful to the FBI, and what is her opinion about her husband's involvement? Um, Diane Ivins uh, has uh, not said a word publicly about her husband in this case. Mm -hmm. um, I've had uh, several very brief uh, conversations with her, and uh, she's, she's declined to talk. What she did do in the aftermath of her husband's suicide was to pay the criminal defense lawyer they had uh, more money to uh, remain uh, responsive to things that were in the public domain, including media inquiries about her husband. So. Through that uh, method, she has uh, talked about it. Beyond that, um, don't know. I wondered about uh, background checks of why somebody with this kind of background was working in that kind of sensitive area to begin with. Uh, outstanding question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, actually, it gets to one of the most surprising things in my research, which was uh, uh, one day I received a response to a Freedom of Information Act request I had made of the Army, um, seeking any and all uh, documents pertaining to evaluations of Bruce Ivins' mental fitness uh, to be doing the highly sensitive work he was doing. Bear in mind, he's working on a daily basis and has unfettered 24-7 access with really <coughs> practically no supervision. That's how it went up there at Fort Detrick to anthrax. And the response I got in very declarative English that I could understand, I was very appreciative of that, <laughs> was that uh, uh, at no point in time in Bruce Ivins' employment by the U.S. Army <clears throat> from December 1980 until uh, mid-2008 uh, did the Army ever evaluate his mental fitness to handle anthrax. Um, that is a shocking uh, dereliction in my opinion, and I'm not the only one. There's a, a, a panel of uh, psychiatrists and other uh, behavioral analysts that were put together in the aftermath of the suicide on the orders uh, at the behest of the Justice Department but with the order uh, from uh, Supervising Chief U.S. District Court Judge here in Washington, Royce Lamberth. They got access to that panel to um, all of the contemporaneous notes from psychiatrists and other therapists who had uh, met with Bruce Ivins over the years going way back to the late 1970s. And this panel concluded in a report that was uh, uh, handed over to Judge Lamberth under seal uh, in August of 2010 uh, that the, uh, there was enough evidence that was visible to the U.S. Army uh, to have, first of all, have prevented Bruce Ivins from being hired, and second of all, along the way, there were all sorts of flags that were never uh, uh, acknowledged. And that, that's consistent with my research, by the way, is that up at Fort Detrick and the Army culture up there and the Medical Command, it was always Bruce being Bruce. I think I may even have a chapter named Bruce being Bruce. Um, and there was this deference to Bruce Ivins as a respected PhD scientist. And, oh, he's a little bit quirky, but we're just not going to look at it. In 1987, he filled out a routine federal employment questionnaire that asked questions about, you know, do you have uh, um, delusions? Do you have flights of fancy, anxiety, um, and, and other more serious things? And he put question marks next to all those things. There was zero follow-up on that. Um, his colleagues knew that he was on a battery of, of psychotropic medications uh, from, from the year at least 1999, 2000 forward. Absolutely nothing was done about that. Uh, in July of 2000, his dose of Celexa was doubled. Um, no pursuit of that was made. Uh, the one thing Ivans had held back when he would, see every year he'd have to go in and get a re-up on his anthrax vaccine booster. Um, and it's like going into a doctor's office. They ask you, well, any new medications? What's going on? And so he would dutifully tell them what was going on. Yeah, double the Celexa, uh, Prozac, Trozan, doing this, Lunesta, you name it. Uh, but the one thing he held back was that he'd been put on uh, Zyprexa, which is an antipsychotic, uh, as of July of 2000. Uh, that was the one thing he held back. But all those flags were never pursued by the Army. The expert behavioral panel concluded that the Army uh, completely blew it. And if uh, people in a supervisory capacity had done their jobs, uh, the anthrax letter attacks may well have been prevented. I think, yeah, top row there, we have time for one last question. He's going to bring the mic up. While, while he's doing that, I'll, I'll ask one last question myself. Um, uh, a New York Times magazine cover story <coughs> last month had this very scary headline, we are still not ready. Uh, and they were talking about a bioterrorism bio attack uh, on the United States. 
What do you what do you think? Are we still not ready for for an, uh, an attack? Well, again, be it anthrax or anything else. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's relative. I mean, uh, we now have in the aftermath of the anthrax letter attacks twelve uh, sort of certified pathogens, special list pathogens: anthrax, uh, smallpox, tularemia, plague. We go down the list uh, that we're supposed to consider as viable threats. Um, so I think what is our vulnerability? I would have to go uh, agent by agent and then mm -hmm. question what is the intelligence behind the assumption that we have a threat from each of those agents. I think on anthrax and just yeah. in, and generally, I mean, I, to be fair, I think we are better prepared than we were 10 years ago when the FBI had two microbiologists under its employ. Um, we do have uh, uh, a lot of uh, medical countermeasures that have now been acquired that in the event of an attack with some of these uh, dreaded pathogens could be used. Um, so do we have a lot of soft targets in a country this large, in a country this big? Absolutely. Look at our agriculture. I mean, drive, drive through uh, ranches and farms and ask yourself, uh, is the water and the, and the food that we're growing there for shipment and, and eating, uh, is it somewhat at risk? Yes, it is. It's a matter of degree. Right. Final question on, on top there. Uh, what were the circumstances leading up to his suicide, and, and had any legal action been taken at that mm. point? Okay. Uh, well, Bruce Ivins uh, uh, was, was very wary of that he was under investigation for years and years and years. Uh, and by the way, parenthetically, he was telling the FBI beginning in October, November of 2002 that he thought any number of his colleagues may be the perpetrator. He ultimately fingered up to seven of his current or former colleagues. Um, he, uh, Bruce Ivins, though, was actually assisting the FBI as sort of a consultant to the investigation in those early years. Stephen Hatfield, he was clearly the lead suspect. Um, it wasn't until November 1st of 2007, if you can believe that, that the FBI ever searched Bruce Ivins' home, his vehicles, to find any potential evidence. He certainly knew as of November 1st, 2007, that he was a very serious suspect. And obviously, I mean, he was, uh, he was almost, I would say, paranoid about being in, in under investigation for the preceding two years based on his conversations with people, his behavior at at least one conference I have in mind in September of 2005 in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is detailed in the book. Uh, and then his emails show that he's getting more and more fearful that he's under investigation. Um, as of uh, 2008, there were three final interviews that his attorney agreed to where Bruce Ivins met face-to-face -face with the lead FBI investigators and the lead prosecutors in this case. Um, and it was obvious the case was very serious. Uh, coming into June of 2008, and I believe on June 9th was, would have been the final interview he had with the FBI, immediately thereafter, Bruce Ivins was informed by his defense lawyer uh, that he uh, should expect to be indicted for the an five anthrax <coughs> murders and that it may very well may, may be a death penalty case. So Bruce Ivins assisted his lawyer in filling out the paperwork and submitting it again to our friend Judge Lamberth uh, to get federal assistance for a death penalty defense. So he knew he was in jeopardy of being indicted. He, he talked about it all the time and wrote about it in emails. Uh, and then we come down to the dramatic events in July. Uh, I'm skipping his being hospitalized, by the way, in two different locations for uh, in the aftermath of one suicide attempt in March of 2008 uh, and then showing other signs of uh, abusing alcohol so he was hospitalized for rehab. Uh, on July 9th uh, of, of 2008 he went to a group therapy session, uh, told uh, his uh, fellow participants in the group therapy session in the presence of a, of a counselor and a psychologist that he was going to be indicted uh, for the anthrax for the five murders and that he wasn't going to go down for these murders. He was going to go out blazing. And he said that his uh, son was bringing him another, uh, a new weapon, which was going to be a Glock. Uh, uh, his other handguns had been seized in the November 1st, 2007 search. Mm -hmm. um, so the next day he was uh, approached by uh, Frederick police because uh, the, the uh, therapist at the session called the local police, felt there was a, actually a legal duty she had to report that this guy could be dangerous. The police went in and led him out, not in handcuffs, but led him out and took him to Frederick Memorial Hospital where he was put under immediate observation and then the next day was transferred to Shepherd Pratt, which is a psychiatric hospital up in Towson. Uh, he was there for the better part of two weeks, was released uh, within 24 hours of being released, went to the local uh, uh, supermarket and bought uh, uh, a huge uh, packet of Tylenol PM 
and uh, ultimately the blood work at the hospital when he was rushed there uh, two nights later, the, actually the Sunday morning of July 27th, showed that he had a massive overdose of Tylenol along with a benzodiazepine, which was probably Valium, which he was taking all the time. I'm just surprised he was running around loose all that time <laughs> with all this evidence against him and given that he was suspected of killing all these people. Yeah, I, before he was released from Shepherd Pratt, um, as I say in my book, the lead prosecutor on the case made a, uh, a, an emphatic effort uh, to try and keep him institutionalized there. But uh, both Bruce Ivins and his lawyer uh, and the uh, clinicians who examined him at Shepherd Pratt said, hey, you're good to go, you're fine. Um, that's what happened. Well, we've run out of time. The book is The Mirage Man. I want to thank David Willman for joining us here uh, this afternoon for Inside Media. And again, David will be uh, signing copies of his book right outside the studio here in the, interactive, uh, in the Internet, TV, and Radio Gallery. Uh, a reminder, tomorrow we're back with another Inside Media at 2.30, right in the same studio with CNN Pentagon correspondent Christopher Lawrence. It's part of our Veterans Day uh, weekend programming. I also want to thank Altria for uh, their sponsorship of this weekend. Uh, that's why veterans and uh, acting, active personnel are free this weekend. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Really good.